All right, let's go back to Matthew chapter 5 now. Um, we're studying a certain section of Matthew chapter 5. This will be the last lesson on this in this series. Uh, we want to read from verse 38 to verse 42. He says, uh, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. We'll be concentrating on verse 41 and 42 today. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go to with him, or go with him to. Uh, you may know or you may not know, um, but this directive uh, with regard to forcing us to go one mile uh, is connected to the Persian messengers who had the royal authority to press into service horses, ships, and even men to assist them to get where they needed to go with the king's message. So it sort of all harkens back to that. Uh, it was what's been a terrible inconvenience for people because if your horse was uh, seconded, so to speak, for the, for the job and you wanted it for, to get somewhere or to do something, uh, they had the right to take it and there was nothing you could do about it. Uh, if you were in the ship and you were the master of the ship and uh, they came along and they claimed the ship for a, a particular purpose. Um, your life and making you do things that you never thought you might have to do. Uh, there is a scriptural example of this and I'd like us to go to Matthew chapter 27 and verse 32. This is um, just before the crucifixion of Christ it says in verse 32, as they were coming out, this is the Roman soldiers with Jesus carrying his cross, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, whom they pressed into service to bear his cross. This was a man from North Africa, probably a Jew, 
who lived in North Africa. Uh, he's uh, up here in Jerusalem, obviously to worship or whatever. He's coming in from the country, not knowing that his day is going to be greatly disrupted. And uh, they press him into service. It's, it's not a matter of, will you do this? Here, you're doing this until we're finished with you. So he carried the cross for Jesus. Now, there are all sorts of implications in this uh, when we talk about the Via Dolorosa and Jesus carrying the cross and all. Uh, it seems like if he did carry, he did carry a cross, but it wasn't for very long because he obviously hadn't got the strength to carry it. And this man was carrying the cross for him. Um, there's some lots of, I think there's lessons in that for us, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that another time. Uh, Luke is very interesting in regard to this. Luke chapter 23, 26 and 27. Luke chapter 23, 26 and 27. It says, and when they led him away, that's Jesus, they seized the man. Now you see, Luke is getting, getting to the core of it. They grab this fellow, uh, uh, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. And following him were a large crowd of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. So <clears throat> they seized him and they pressed him into service. That's the point. Now, he's telling the early Christians... Um, and particularly um, even before the early Christians, the Jews who he's speaking to, he says, if you're being forced to go one mile, go with him two miles. In other words, don't build up any resentment to this. Don't have any hostility in your heart to this. Don't fight this. This may be an evil that is unfair and unjust, but he says, don't let this situation and these people rob you of the love of God in your heart. This is the whole point about this, these instructions. We, we have uh, embraced a certain attitude of heart towards God and towards our fellow man. And these situations are set up by the devil, no doubt, to break our resolve to be as God would want us to be, to rob us of that love of God in our hearts, make us resentful, make us uh, ready to fight and to stand our ground and to assert our rights. Uh, and he's, he's telling us there are some of these situations we just, for the sake of God and the glory of God and what you are, are as a Christian, to just go along with it. And in your non-resistance to this evil, don't just go as far as they want you to go. Willingly go the extra mile with these people. Along the same lines of enforcement, let's have a look at uh, Luke chapter 3, 12 to 14. These were questions that were given to John the Baptist when he was in the height of his ministry by tax collectors and uh, soldiers. Luke chapter 3, 12 through 14. He says there, <clears throat> And some tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? Now, tax collectors were usually Jewish people that were acting on behalf of the Roman government. They were hated in Israel. They were hated, not only because they were working for a foreign power who had subjected them, uh, but because they would not just collect the tax that was due, they would add to it so that they could enrich themselves by, you know, putting on, uh, they, they, had to, they had to say the figure. So the figure in their minds was inflated. It was, it was a way of getting extra money out of people and people's hands were tied with regard to this. So the tax uh, collectors uh, questioned John the Baptist, teacher, what shall we do? And he said, collect no more than what you have been ordered to. 
Think about that. There is, a, there is an amount which you were asked to collect. Collect no more than that amount. Don't go beyond it for, for personal reasons or personal enrichment, he says. Just do your duty. You're just rubbing salt in the wound to be going beyond that and forcing people to pay what they are not even required to pay by law. So he says, keep within those limits. That's what you need to do. <clears throat> now, at the same time, some soldiers came to uh, John the Baptist. And, it's, uh, and, they said, uh, and he said to them uh, in verse 14, some soldiers were questioning him, saying, and what about us? What shall we do? And he said to them, do not take money from anyone by force. See, they couldn't even take money from you by force. We, maybe it was the bribe that we were talking about last week. You, you pay me or else I'll inconvenience you all day. I'll tie you up uh, in knots, and, so to speak, so that you'll not be able to get away from, from me. And he says, just don't do this sort of thing. He says, uh, just do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. There's a lot to be said for being content with your wages. Most of us are not content with our wages, especially when we see somebody else is getting more than we are. I know um, in, in, in our society here, um, there was times when uh, groups of people, say the nurses or, or the taxi men or whatever else, they, they, they get a rise. And that, all that did was inflame everybody else. Everybody else then wanted a rise. The teachers wanted a rise. The council workers wanted a rise. Everybody wanted a rise. Yeah. So... It's easy to trigger the greed in everybody else. But he says, we need to be content. The, tr the, the thing is, uh, when Jesus gives that parable about paying the workers who came in early in the day and very an, an hour before it was time to finish work, and he paid them all the same wage, and the ones that were sweating, working all day for him, says, well, that's not fair. And he says, it's my money to do what I want with my money. I agreed something with you and you said you would work for that money. I'm giving you what you agreed to. Now, if, just as a matter of interest, if you feel that you're not being paid, go, don't get jealous of somebody else, go and talk to the boss and say, I need a raise. I'm not managing to make things or to pay the bills or whatever you need to do and uh, and do and just do that and see if you can get get the raise or work something to where it might come later on in the year or whatever else but at least you've done something about it if he says no there's nothing you can do other than leave the job and get another job to try and get more money but try and be content with your wages and that will save a lot of trouble in your life uh, and we're, we're all so uptight and driven with all of these things that we need to be very careful indeed. So Christians in positions of power <clears throat> should not abuse their power but act with justice and fairness towards others under their charge. If you've got, <clears throat> if you're in charge or you're the boss or whatever and you've got people under you, we need to think of justice and fairness as we treat or talk to or interact with those people that are under us. That's the only way Christians can manage this. And it's in keeping with what John the Baptist has said. <clears throat> we should not practice extortion and we won't if we're content with our wages. We'll be only tempted to do that if we think we're not getting enough. 
what, what happens, bosses are making mistakes by not giving the people sufficient to meet their needs. Because what people will do, is, uh, here in Ireland anyway, they'll start robbing stuff to make up the difference that they believe is the shortfall in what they're being paid. And years ago in Ireland when the British ruled here, you'd have your hands cut off if you were found robbing. I tell you, there wouldn't be hardly one person in Ireland with two hands <laughs> these days if they were going to do the same thing now. That, that, I'm, I'm really, we're laughing, but it's really not funny. It's actually very bad. See how we're made to compromise our standards and our behavior? We need to be aware of how the devil works and we need to be very careful. If, however, Christians are forced by officials to do the tasks that are humiliating as Simon of Cyrene was forced to do, we should do it for Christ without resentment and hatred. If we are forced to walk one mile by an official, we should willingly walk two with him. We should be willing to forgo our rights and our pride in the greater cause of being perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now I realise here, this, this is heavy stuff. This is, this is absolutely enormous. Uh, it weighs, certainly weighs heavily on me. I, I, how, how am I ever going to get up to this standard of behaviour? How am I ever going to fulfil what the Lord is asking us to do here? This is not easy stuff. This means that we, were, we are certainly completely different in our thinking and in our behaviour to the rest of the world. And if they look at us and see that this is the way we're behaving and thinking, they'll realise this is something unique. This is, this is not the way we feel or the way we think or, be, or behave. So there's a, a swallowing of pride and foregoing of rights in this behaviour. Now, the question now in my mind is, well, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? Well, we can learn how to forego our rights and our pride from early Christians who were in slavery and were considered property by their masters with no rights. Many of these slaves were converted. It was the only liberty that they would ever find in this life. And was, there was millions of them. The Holy Spirit instructed them, and I'd like you to see the instruction he gives to the slaves as to how to cope with a situation where you've got no rights, where you are property, and where you are open to abuse every day of your life. Every day of your life. Not just once or twice, every day of your life. Watch this, Colossians chapter 3, 22 to 25. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 22. Slaves, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth. Alright, here's, here's obedience. Who wants to be obedient to a master who considers I'm just property? Who has no respect for me? He says, that's what you've got to do. Not with external service, he says. It's not a matter of just doing what you're asked to do and, and demonstrating that you will do it. He says, that way you might only be pleasing men. He says, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Here's an attitude that, in which the slave now realizes that his master is not the be-all and the end-all, that the one who controls all and is in charge of the whole universe is Jesus Christ, his Lord. And because his Lord has asked him to obey this master on earth, he wholeheartedly obeys him. He's, he's not just willing to do the task, he's willing to do the task well to glorify Christ. He's willing not to complain. He's willing not to pilfer. 
He's willing just to do it because he's been asked to do it and to do it in a way that brings glory to his master, Jesus Christ our Lord. 23. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Now I can well imagine the slaves, you want me to do this? Yes sir, yes sir, I'll do it. And then moves this and they moves that. Is there any heart in it? No. This is pure resentment. It's a, I'll, I'll do it, but I don't want to do it, and I resent you telling me I have to do it. He says, do it heartily for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. This is the way out. It's mental and spiritual. I am living in a different realm to this real world that I'm facing. And I'm serving the Lord and not these people who believe that I am their property and that I have no rights and that I shall be given no consideration. I'm a free man in Christ. I have got eternal life in Jesus Christ my Lord. I just need to persevere with what's happening to me and all the injustices that I'm enduring with a good heart. Do you think you could have done it? Mm. Of course, in all these matters, Jesus is always the perfect example for us. And Peter has something to say about this in 1 Peter chapter 2, 20 to 24. I'll read from verse 19. This finds favour. If for the sake of conscience toward God a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. I know one of the things my poor mother was um, really had a, a, a resentment to was when she was treated unjustly or accused in the wrong. She really hated it. And uh, here's the Lord telling us that what finds favour in God's eyes is that we would be willing to suffer these injustices for conscience sake. Uh, uh, and so that our conscience is not defiled and that our commitment to Christ and Christ's righteousness is consistent. You're bearing up under these sorrows in order to do that. And you're suffering unjustly in order to serve Christ in righteousness and holiness all the days of your life. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favour with God. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. This, this is worlds apart from what you're seeing on the God channel in, 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 on the television. You're going to live an abundant life. Everything is going to fall in place for you. You're going to be rich. You're going to have every material thing that you want. Jesus Christ never promised any of that. <coughs> what if you're suffering unjustly? Are you now rejected by God? Is God looking at you or on you in, dis in disfavor? Is he allowing this to hurt you or, or because you're a reject of some sort? No, this, this actually brings out real Christianity in your life. Real commitment to Christ in your life. This is a new situation beyond all of what the denominational world will understand with regard to Christ and the way we serve Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, uh, where am I here? I'm getting carried away. 
it's, it's, uh, this finds favor with God. It's this that finds favor with God. So we have to decide Am I going to struggle with this in my soul? Or am I going to simply say, mm, this is really, let's get a little bit over the top. This is typical Steve stuff, and it's really just, uh, it's a bit annoying, but we'll, we'll listen to it anyway, and we'll just get back to normal then when everything is, is finished here at services. Or are we really going to accept it and say, that's the standard God wants from me? I want to do something about that. I want to live that way. All right, let's move on. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow. It, it seems superficially, hey, I want to borrow your car and I have to give it to him. Mm, that just doesn't sit well, does it? Doesn't, doesn't even sound right. Uh, just because I ask, then I've got the upper hand over the Christian and he's just got to deliver because I've asked. I don't think it's that way. There, there, you see, he's talking to Jews and there's a context. He's still under the Old Testament law. And he's, 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 what he's trying to get across to them is how he's taking the Old Testament law and extending it bringing it to them on a higher level than they have understood from the Pharisees or were practicing in their own lives. So we've got to, uh, in, the, in the laws from the Old Testament, uh, they, they will, if we look at a few of these laws, they can explain the context of the asking and the borrowing for us. And it's in that context that uh, he can make just a simple statement Give to him who asks of you, and from him who wants to borrow, do not turn away. Let's, let's first of all uh, have a look uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy chapter 15. Verses 7 and 8. If there is a poor man with you, one of your brothers, in any of your towns in your land, which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your heart, nor close your hand from your poor brother. Now we can, we can be going about on our daily life, walking the streets, and we are oblivious to anybody who's poor or in need. We can have people on our streets who are struggling and we wouldn't know, nor would we care. We need to be very careful with this. We need to be very careful with this. These, these laws are righteous laws. They're in keeping with what God, the standard God expects uh, in keeping with justice and with fairness and with what is right. Don't forget the new heavens and the new earth in which dwells righteousness suggests that righteousness is the absolute law of behavior in the new heavens and the new earth. We need to be starting to get used to what righteousness really means. How we can, how we can feel for other people, love other people, do good to other people, care for other people, forgive other people. It's this interaction. Actually, when you, when you think about it, the first commandment is to love God with all your heart. That means a relationship with God. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. That means a relationship with your neighbor. It's all about relationships. Not about you, or how successful you are, or how brilliant you are, or what you've achieved, or what you're going to do, or where you're going to go. It's about relationships. And that means embracing everybody in our society. The poor as well as the rich. The rich want to monopolize this life. And they can dominate it pretty well. But the poor 
don't have much of a chance. And if we don't see them, nobody will. Nobody will. For the poor will never cease to be in the land, the Lord told the Israelites. Therefore I, com I, I command you, saying, you shall freely open your hand to your poor brother, to your needy and poor in your land. Deuteronomy 15 verse 11. They're always going to be here. So what are we going to do about it? Well, he says, I expect you to open your hand freely to these poor people and help them, give them what they need. Deuteronomy 24, 10 through 13. He says, when you make your neighbor a loan, this is where the borrowing comes in. When you make your neighbor a loan of any sort, you shall not enter his house to take his pledge. You shall remain outside, and the man to whom you make the loan shall bring the pledge out to you. If he is a poor man, you shall not sleep with his pledge. Usually the pledge was the outer garment. That when the sun goes down, you shall surely return the pledge to him, that he may sleep in his cloak and bless you, and it will be righteousness for you before the Lord your God. This, this is, uh, the, the Israelites were to be very considerate people. Now, when, when there was a pledge given, uh, he was not to go into that person's house. You can imagine the bombastic rich person. Oh, you want to give me, you want to give me a, a pledge, do you? Right then, let's go. And he'd walk into the house and, oh, there, there it is, I'll take that, that'll be the pledge. He doesn't want you to go into their home. You need to respect them. Show respect to them in there, even if they're poor. They're fellow human beings made in the image of God. Re show respect. Stand outside. Let them bring it out to you. And don't hold on to it all night if that's all they've got to sleep in and keep themselves warm. Bring it back to them. What an inconvenience for the person. And me, I'm, I, he's, he's borrowing my money. And I have to go back and bring his cloak, which he gave as surety for that loan. He borrowed it from me. I'm not going to do that. Who does that fellow think he is anyway? Well, it's not who that fellow thinks he is. It's who God thinks he is. That's the point here. Who God thinks he is. God shows no partiality. Rich or poor, kings or paupers, no partiality. Religious, unreligious, no partiality. If you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you are not to act as a creditor to him. You shall not charge him interest. Now they did expect to be paid back. But they weren't allowed to charge their fellow Israelite interest. Interesting, isn't it? So why was he giving them a lend in the first place? Because he was poor and he wasn't able to make ends meet. Because I'm trying to help him to make ends meet. Save his life and his family's life. Put food on the table for them. This is not just, can I borrow your law more? This is life and death stuff. It's in the context of this that Jesus talks about lending and borrowing. <coughs> lending was a, a way of helping the poor man to have sufficient for his need. Because the law insisted on looking after the poor, the response from the wicked and the righteous, of course, to this law was completely different. He says, the wicked borrows and does not pay back. And if he was the one lending in the first place, he'd probably have their legs broken in order to get his money back. But the righteous is gracious and gives, according to Psalm 37, 21. The righteous also pays back what he has borrowed. Because it's a matter of honesty. And of uprightness. And before the Lord I borrowed. 
And before the Lord I will pay back. Because that's what the Lord would want me to do. It's not a matter that I have my arm twisted or I've been threatened. I will do this heartily for the Lord. So what we're seeing in this context now is that it has, uh, what Jesus is saying, has this Old Testament background to it. It gives it a context and makes more sense of it to me anyway. I hope it does to you. But he's taking it, he's taking it a step further. He's going beyond what was required by the law. The law allowed you to get your money back. Christ expects us not to expect anything back. We can see this in Luke chapter 6. He expands on what Jesus had said in Matthew. Luke chapter 6, 30 to 35. He says, Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. Now I think again in, in this um, exchange or this, uh, this way of behaving, if they take it away from you, uh, I presume it's they've forcefully taken it away from you. And it's like if they take your shirt, then offer to him your coat also. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. It's a great statement. It's an it's a, it's absolutely wonderful standard by which to behave. How would I want them to treat me under, these, under his circumstances? How would I want them to? And that, there's the rule of thumb for us. Then we, now we know, because here I've got to treat them in the same way. But they don't deserve it. Yeah, I know that. But they're my enemy. He's trying to destroy me. The Lord knows that as well. Is that evil? Yes, it is. Are we to resist the evil on this personal level? No. See, what, what's, what's happening here is the Lord ex ex expects us to understand that standing on your rights is not necessarily going to achieve the ends that God wants you to achieve. You might have to give way here in order to achieve what God wants you to achieve. You might have to swallow your pride. And I'll tell you something, don't choke on it. It's probably the best thing that you've ever done in your whole life, swallowing your pride. Because really, we've got nothing to be proud of. You might say, speak for yourself, Steve. Now that might be true. But I'm, I'm, I, if I understand the scriptures correctly, since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, how proud do you want to stand before the Lord? How humble we should be, recognizing when we look at all the faults of other people and think, thank God I'm not like other men. <laughs> You're not, are you not? You're not. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. And but for the grace of God, we might be in the same position that they're in. We've got to make concessions here. And we've got to do what the Lord is asking us to do in terms of this uh, treating others the same way we want them to treat it. If you love those who love you, what credit is, is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to them who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to them from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Now, I, just, I will put in this proviso. If you are lending somebody something... Don't tell them you expect nothing in return. You're asking for trouble. 
this is something between you and God. You're expecting nothing in return. Give it to them under the understanding that they will pay it back or give it back. If it doesn't come back, you weren't ever looking for anything in return anyway. Just a thought. He says, love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. What we're, what we're recognizing here, what he wants us to recognize here, is that you are now becoming more like God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is what God, this is the indignity and the ungratefulness and the unfairness that God is dealing with day after day to all that he's doing for human beings. This is the evil that's been thrown, thrown at in his face uh, in return for the, all the good and all the kindness that he's poured out on all of us. So we're learning to be like God in Christ. We're moving closer to God. No wonder the reward is great. Because what God does is right. It's righteous. It's good. It's holy. It's a fulfillment of justice and of fairness. It is the great compassion and kindness that is in his heart that makes him do all of this. His mercy and forgiveness allows him to do all of this. But it's a, it's a price that only we will begin to understand when we start paying it ourselves in our own lives. Now, even when we've put it in its right context, there, uh, these instructions presuppose um, the means and the opportunity. That's very important. To be able to give, we must have the means and the opportunity to to give. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. He says, so then while we have opportunity let us do good to all people especially to those who are of the household of faith. Galatians 6, 9 and 10. But in order to have the means, we have to work to earn a living. But in our working to earn a living, it's you come home with your salary well, you don't anymore. They put it into your bank account. But in, in, in my day when you were young, you got a little brown envelope and you got it in cash. Oh, it, was, oh, it was great to open that envelope and just to count, count out the money. And of course, you didn't want anybody else to see you because this is my money. My money. I didn't borrow it from money. I earned it. It's mine. But I tell you what, whether, they put, whether you put it in your bank account or not, that's really the same attitude that we, we have in our hearts. This is my money. And he had to tell in Ephesians 4 the, the person who was stealing, he says, let him who steals, steal no longer, but rather let him labor with his hands. Labor, labor. And was that, that was, a, that was a, a nasty word to a thief. He doesn't want to work. He, don't, he wants to get easy money. But he's not the only one in the world who wants easy money. We want easy money. But he says, we have to get it into our heads. We have to earn the money in order to have to provide for our family. But he tells the thief... He tells the thief, let's look there in Ephesians chapter 4. It's very, this is really important. And it's not to be missed. Ephesians 4 verse 28, I believe. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have some, watch this, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Oh, now there's another stipulation. The money is not just mine. I need to have whatever money I've got. I need to be able to share some of that with somebody who has need. I need to give the first fruits of that to the Lord and I need to share some of that with people who have need. Loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. 
The principle is all the same here in, the, in this sort of behavior. Paul, when he was at um, Thessalonica, he says he was preaching the gospel and he was working night and day, physically working. He was a tent maker. And he says, I, I've, I've given first Thessalonians 3, I've, I've done this to give you an example and to show you that a man must earn a living. No matter how hard pressed he is to do that, he must earn a living. Work, the work ethic must become ingrained in our head. Socialism and social welfare and so forth can, can numb people into believing that they deserve to get help from the government without doing any work whatsoever for it. The Bible teaches we have to work to earn a living, not only for ourselves and our families, but in order to help those who are poorer than we are. Every Christian must be willing to work to earn a living and be able to help all those who are in need. Instruct those who are rich in this present world. And we're the rich. If you live in America, you're rich. But if you live in Ireland, you're just as rich. So, here's the instruction for you. Not to be conceited or to fix your hope on the uncertainty of riches. What you're planning to do with your riches might never happen. The parable of the farmer whose land was productive is proof of that. He built his bigger barns. He said to his soul, soul of many, uh, of, of many goods laid up for many years to come. My whole future is secured. And the Lord said, you fool, this night your soul is required of you. He didn't enjoy anything of it. I know plenty of people who, when we retire, will do this and will do that. I heard my dad talking about things like that. My mother died at 60 from cancer. He was all alone. There was nothing he could do. There was nothing he could do. They fought a lot about money. He did more than she did. She spent it. He fought about it. <laughs> but I tell you, he was ready when she was dying. He was ready to give her everything that he had. But it was far too late to learn that lesson. Because she had become a Christian and she said, I don't want it. I don't need it. So you see, don't put your hope in the uncertainty of riches. Put on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. Remember always, it's God who is enriching you. You're working hard. I, I don't, want, don't want to take that away from you. You have the right to get your wages at the end of the week. Don't want to take that away from you. But it's God that's given you the strength and the power and probably made it possible for you to have the job that you have. In order to have the, 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 this thing under your control, we must have a healthy detachment from material things. Why? Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your heart is on money and on material things and riches, you can't serve two masters. It's got to be first and foremost on God who richly supplies you with all these things to enjoy. That's where it should be, not on the possessions or the riches that you're saving up for yourself. It can't be that way. We must seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all the things that we need, the clothes, the food, the, the uh, shelter, the uh, homes that we have, it'll all be added to you. He's not trying to rob you of anything. He'll give you what you need. Just trust him.
Job was a righteous man. And listen to what he achieved. If I have kept the poor from their desire, or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or have eaten my morsel alone, and the orphan has not shared it, if I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing, or that the needy had no covering, if loins have not thanked me, and if he has not been worn by the fleece of my sheep, if I have lifted up my hand against the orphan because I saw I had support in the gate, let my shoulder fall from its socket and my arm be broken off from the elbow. Job 31, 16 through 22. There was a man who was aware of what was going on about him, of people's needs and of his ability as a rich man to supply those needs. And he did not begrudge it. He was putting himself under a curse if his eyes weren't open to these things. Let my arm fall off from the socket, he says. It seemed, uh, when I was studying this, it really seemed an impossible task. An impossible task that Jesus is asking us to do. But of course, he's not asking us to do it on our own. He'll give us the help to do it. But I, I really believe, if my own experience is anything to go by, it's going to be an almighty, an almighty struggle in your own soul to try and accept this and to work with it. But it's worth the struggle. Because this is the way the children of God store up treasures for themselves in heaven. I'll leave it with you. Thank you.